Hello and welcome to another episode of Copper Bottomed, the genuine and trustworthy look at the all things copper and what's happening in the copper market. This is the the first uh, episode of 2024, and um, I've. I've done quite a lot of research over the last couple of weeks. You know, when the when the news releases stop coming through as things tend to shut down over Christmas, it gives one time to do to do some research. And so, over the course of uh, the last couple of weeks, I've had time to look at the market. Um, so let's crack on. If you take the year in review, twenty twenty three. Uh, you can see there's been some very, very wide divergence in the performance of some of the commodities, uh, notably uh, uranium up 86%, go uranium bulls, um, and lithium down 81%. Um, and yet in the middle, fundamentally, copper was flat. Okay, it's up 3%. But remember the basis on which this occurred. Uh, a year ago, the economic outlook for 2023 was very poor. Lots of people were worried about the economic um, situation and um, it hasn't actually been that positive. Um, Balancing that, there have been some supply constraints and the forecast burgeoning supply uh, surplus, production surplus over demand hasn't actually appeared. And uh, flat on the year or 3% uh, growth in terms of price um, on the year is not a bad um, uh, result. Now, as you probably will remember, over the last three months, I've been talking about how the um, demand for copper reta- stays relatively strong and also how the um, the International Copper Study Group had been forecasting for a surplus in the copper market Um in 2023 and again into 2024 and that surplus was 460 odd thousand tons remember this is in a uh, 25 26 million ton per annum market of which mined copper is around 21 million tons so it was a pretty small percentage um that surplus and of course we've had things like Cobre panama closing down we've had um tech uh, and anglo-american reducing their guidance for 2024. So the the perceived surplus for 2024 has been eroded away and it's now leading to um, commentary and uh, headlines like this. So um, from CNBC a couple of days ago, five days ago now, um, copper could skyrocket over 75% to record highs by 2025. And the so 2025 is, by 2025 means uh, this year. So they're looking for a, a price response to take it up to, let's say, fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 per tonne this year, 2024. Brace for deficits, analysts say. Copper is heading for a price spurt over the next two years. We'll remember that by 2025 is one year, as mining supply disruptions coincide with higher demand for the metal. Okay, and that's CNBC. And then Yahoo Finance also picked it up. Copper prices to surge in 2024? Question mark. Um, Copper prices are poised to surge, again, that figure of 75% in the next two years, primarily due to disruptions in mining supply chains and a growing uh, demand sector. Right. Now, I'm positive on the copper market. I'm bullish. However, uh, (laughs) there's a lot of economic uncertainty out there. And um, I did, I went back to the USGS uh, Global Mind copper production series, which you can look up. Um, they do these annual reports. I looked at some data from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, but um, here we go. On an annual basis from 1993, uh, the last 30 years, um, you can see that the copper industry has been remarkable in delivering growth. Uh, it's added uh, 5 million tons of uh, production every 10 years on average over these last 30 years. Um, so every 10 years, uh, from 95 to 2005, yep, another 5 million tons. From 2005 to 2015, another 5 million tons. So um, that is pretty good going. It's, you know, it's that is a half a million ton mine. It's a 500,000 ton per annum mine every year. It's just delivered in terms of net growth. And remember, this is after depletion. This is after the tarred mines, which are slowing down. This is um, this is um, uh, a net addition to supply. And um, this orange line here, this is the annual growth rate. Yes, it's a bit lumpy, but if you look at it, 
on average, it's almost bang on 3% mine supply copper production growth going forward. Now, to see whether the copper price is going to go up, you've got to look at two things. One is, is the demand going to be stronger than it has been over this period? And secondly, um, is supply actually able to keep up with that 3% growth rate? Now, there's lots of commentary on demand. Um, people that are coming out of COP28, the, the, the big news is that there's going to be this threefold increase in um, renewable infrastructure or new, renewable energy production, which of course is hydro, uh, which is kind of um, growth constrained, solar and uh, wind. Now, if you've been listening for long enough, you will know that I don't think you one should call solar or wind um, renewable because of the associated fossil fuel industries that are required to provide grid backup. So it's much better to call solar and wind intermittent and unreliable energy sources. Nevertheless, they are strong um, drivers of uh, copper demand. But let's put the um, let's put the kind of the holy grail of a strong pull of um, wind and solar drivers to one side, <clears throat> and let's just kind of go on basic uh, economic growth. The the, the, the standard um, requirement for copper in a growing economy. Now, what you can see here, um, let's leave the demand to one side and let's focus on the supply. Now, I think there are a number of reasons why the copper industry is going to struggle to uh, keep up that 3% growth rate at current prices. Robert Friedland has recently been talking about a kind of incentive price of $15,000 per tonne required to stimulate new production. And I agree with him. I actually think it could even be higher than 15,000 tons um, dollars per tonne that is required. And the structural reasons in the copper market, why that is the case, is one, head grade. So over the last um, 50 years, well, actually over the last 15,000 years, kind of global um, copper production head grade has been falling. In the Bronze Age, it was up at around 20%. Uh, in the Industrial Revolution in Cornwall, it was 10 to 15% the head grades. Uh, turn of the century, 1900 uh, in America, it was around 4%. So, you know, we're gradually working through the higher grain grade material and coming to lower grade material. It's hard to get very good data series. I found this one on the internet. Sorry, I don't have the, um, the source reference for this. Um, but 1970, this is the Go global copper production head grade. Uh, talking a between kind of um, around 1% in the 70s and the 80s. And then um, I've come to uh, the great Goering and Rosenbudge um, research that they do, superb work. Um, they say this is a combination of Wood, Mackenzie, Bernstein and their own work. Um, they talk about the average grade of the copper remaining reserve, which is slightly different to the production head grade. But around uh, 1% in the 80s and early 90s and now falling below 0.6%. And I think the average global copper production head grade is around 0.55 or 0.53% from what I can gather. Remember what is required to process 0.5% material. You've got to, first of all, for every ton of um, ore, you've got, let's say it's 0.5% um, um, copper in there and your ore is chalcopyrite, which is 34 and a bit percent um, uh, iron, it's copper, the rest is iron um, and sulfur. So you've got to be looking at ore, which is around one and a half to two percent chalcopyrite, which means that uh, between 98 and 98.5 percent is non-chalcopyrite. Let's call that the non-value mass. Now, um, to get the unit of copper out, you've got to mine more overburden, you've got to strip more rock if it's an open pit to get your ton of ore. Um, if it's an underground mine, you've got to hoist more tons of ore to the surface to get the same unit of um, copper. So there's more energy in um, entrained in that little bit of copper. Plus, you've got to grind and liberate that copper mineral from the rock mass. Now, obviously, in a 1% copper grade, let's call it 3 to 3.5%, three sorry, um, yeah, three to three and a half percent um, ore, which is chalcopyrite. You're going down to uh, one and a half to two percent, which is ore. You've got to grind so much more rock. And remember, grinding is where thirty to forty percent of the energy of a um, of a processing plant is consumed. So a small dropping grade has a huge 
non-linear relationship with the amount of energy that is required to get that copper out. So as grades fall, your energy required is going to um, uh, go up. Secondly, and thirdly, here we go on this on this slide, um, we've got two key, two other key factors. One is that the um, on the left hand side here, you can see that the rate of discovery for these copper deposits pretty much fell off a cliff in 2008. And uh, work by Richard Schodder, in fact, both of these uh, graphs are based on work by Richard Schodder. This was published by S&P Global Market Intelligence in 2022. And I can't remember where I got this one from, but again, it's based on Schodder, uh, Richard Schodder and the Minex Consultancy um, out of Australia. Um, their data shows that the uh, the rate of discovery fell in um, 2028. And since then, the, the number of big discoveries has fallen. But they, they've also got work showing that the average development time for a copper mine is between 16 and 17 years. And guess what? We are now 16 years away from the last kind of batch of big discoveries in the copper industry. So remember that to deliver your 5 million tons new production to just stay at 3% copper um, market growth, you need to have 500,000 ton mine coming on every year. And they just are so uh, rare. I think the only thing I can see um, that's actually kind of going to get there and it hasn't got there yet is a possible expansion of um, um, Kamoa to get up to th that that level. Um, so there's a shortage of uh, recent discoveries. We're 16 years on from the last kind of batch of big discoveries. Anything that is easy to mine and uh, easy to bring into production is kind of on that development pipeline, but the cupboard is looking bare. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is that as you explore more at the surface, and you find more at the surface, you then have to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is a chart showing the depth of the copper um, discoveries with time. And you can, of course, see that the as time goes on, the discoveries become deeper, right down to 3,000 meters. I don't know what um, deposit that one is, but um, there are certainly lots at the kind of 500 meter below surface level. Now, the miracle of modern engineering and technological advancement through improved reagents and through um, the low cost of capital, through uh, relatively low energy sources, and of course, innovations in um, computing, resource modeling, uh, all of these things, including um, block caving and uh, efficiency improvements have delivered a remarkable set of achievements to keep the, the industry able to deliver copper at the same price or possibly even lower. So this is a um, chart of the copper price expressed in dollars uh, per, uh, sorry, in, um, here we go, um, dollars per pound. This is just straight off um, the, uh, of Yahoo Finance. And you can see from 2006 onwards, really, we're basically flat in terms of the copper price. So as the market's been growing, so what's that? Uh, let's call it 20 odd years. So that's added another million tons of production. Um, we've effectively managed to do that with declining grades, with um, deeper ore bodies and deeper deposits below surface. We've managed to do all of that at the same copper price. Bravo. But it's actually even more amazing than that because if you look at the copper price in a constant money term, not in the dollar terms, because since quantitative easing and um, uh, COVID and all of this kind of inflationary money printing that's gone on, real money has actually, um, constant money is different to the US dollar, which is depreciated uh, through inflation. So uh, what I've done here is I've taken the, um, I looked at the monthly copper price and I divided it by the monthly gold price. Uh, since 2000. And what you can actually see is that the copper price is on a downward trend. You know, for 20 years, it's got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to produce um, copper, which is remarkable, but it flies into the face of the fundamental facts that the uh, supply cupboard is, the development cupboard is bare. Um, grades are falling, so more and more energy is required to produce the same unit of copper plus the uh, the installed capacity to be able to mine in terms of trucks and then process the um, the the mineral, the ore, 
has got to be commensurately larger because the grades are lower. Um, plus, these deposits are getting deeper, so you need more energy to get them up, and you need greater capital development. I mean, block caving is fantastic, but my goodness, it needs a lot of capital up front. And one of the reasons why copper prices were so low during this period is that interest rates were low. Money was cheap, and um, the, the U.S. shale revolution provided um, uh, a an abundance of oil into the market, so energy prices prices remained low. Now, interest rates are no, now no longer that low, and despite all of the technological innovation in uh, the U.S., the oil markets look as if they're tightening up and I think we're coming out of a period of relatively cheap money and cheap energy, and you've got um, deep and low-grade copper deposits. Therefore, to um, supply the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years of copper, we need much, much higher prices in copper. Friedland says $15,000 per tonne. I agree. I think it could be a lot higher. And I fundamentally believe that the Companies that are going to do well are the explorers which can produce results uh, in uh, of good quality for projects that are near surface with simple metallurgy, simple geometry. Um, yes, in a rising tide, uh, right? Yes, a rising tide will float many boats, and so your low grade, uh, high capex, deep stuff might float as well. And if you want to take a leverage play on that, that's all well and good, but I'm very much focused on good grade, good metallurgy, simple geometry, relatively close to surface. Those are the companies that are going to be the outperformers um, in the copper market and possibly in the overall resources sector going forward. So um, that's been my kind of macro uh, thesis of the last few weeks distilled into um, whatever it is, 10 or 15 minutes uh, of your time. I hope that's been helpful. Now straight on to the results. Uh, Early in this year, in the year, there are never many uh, reported results. Uh, DLP Resources has got the largest in theory intersection. Um, As you know from previous uh, uh, episodes, uh, when you go into the DLP Resources, you'll find that it's not actually a copper uh, project. It's a mole project, and they just do this dreadful thing of reporting copper equivalents, which one shouldn't do. So, um, no point talking about DLP on a copper show. And um, we've got Benton Resources, um, an old favorite, Hercules Silver, an old favorite, and uh, Cascadia Minerals, a new entrant with a micro uh, intercept. But we'll we'll come on to that. Right. Benton Resources is a Canadian company exploring uh, the Great Burnt uh, project in Newfoundland. Uh, it's been on Crux once. Uh, it, Matt did an interview a couple of weeks ago, possibly before Christmas, which I highly recommend uh, you watch. Uh, It it provides a good insight. We spoke about it on Taking Stock, and Matt really wants to um, know what the strategy is for this company. Um, I'm taking a slightly kind of more basic approach, which is that as long as they keep delivering these kinds of drill results, the value, I think, in theory, has to go up. The market capitalization is relatively unchallenging $33 million. They're trading at 20 cents. The most recent um, intercept was 25.4 meters at five and uh, five and a half percent for 140 grade um, thickness. And you can see that the share price has responded in the last couple of months, but it hasn't really taken off beyond that. And um, that valuation of $33 million, I think, is unchallenging for the kind of things that they're delivering. And so what are they delivering? Well, here we go. Here's the headline. Benton intersects 5.51% copper over 25 meters, including 8% over 10 meters in hole 12 at Great Burnt. Right. Good. That's a that's a corker. That's a real corker. 8% over 10 meters. That's that, those, those are really good results. Right. Um, uh, as a reminder, they are putting out results from their recently completed phase one drill program at the Great Burnt Copper Deposit in South Central Newfoundland. The latest three drill holes have significantly expanded the continuity of the high-grade core, long strike, and down plunge, and it remains open to further expansion. Right, so let's have a look at that on the long section. 
here, and you can see the three holes that they put in are 13, which is out over here, outside of the kind of an old envelope, uh, 14, which is down here, which I think is deep, and then 12 here, which is a kind of an infill, and this is the one that's got the corker thicknesses. Now, interestingly, Benton have been pretty good about their news releases, and this is a very simple one, but it, it's lacking a couple of um, key things. One is that uh, there are no cross sections yet, which I think is really important for me to uh, maintain my enthusiasm for this. I want to see some cross sections because you never know what it's looking like um, off plane. And they don't really give you any information on holes 13 and 14. You've got to look at the little table and the table was micro tiny. And um, they did include this uh, long section at high resolution, which was useful. But uh, just to just from this table, you can see here uh, uh, from 311 to 316 meters down hole as 4.6 meters at 2.3% copper. And here uh, they got uh, from 361 to 365, they got just under four meters at 3.3, I'm sorry, sorry, the, the one above, 360 meters to 366. They've got 5.82 meters at 2.16% copper. So another good intersection here. And uh, in terms of further results to come, look for the black stars, 16, 17, oh, 15. This one's 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So another eight holes to come, and I wouldn't bet against them being poor in any sense of the word. So unchallenging market capitalization, more drill good drill results to come. Please uh, put some uh, cross sections out and please uh, provide a little bit more legibility on the tables of the results. Um, what, do the, what do they say? The company continues to be very encouraged with the expansion of this high grade system where it remains open, up and down dip, down plunge and a long strike. Boom. That's fantastic. Mic drop. Looking forward to further results as we prepare for the upcoming drill program. Yes, we're looking forward to further results too. Um, with the, the, the drill program has the objective of expanding and continuing to in, confirm and improve upon the known high grades within the deposit. Perfect. Short and sweet. We like. Very good. Right. Hercules Silver. Okay. Hercules Silver. Oh my goodness. What a story this is. In October, they published drill hole 05, 185 meters of 0.84% copper. The market cap exploded. They went up seven or eight times. And then everyone's saying, oh, these latest results are terrible. And the, the share price has come off half. Interestingly, their market capitalization is still $182 million Canadian. So six times the value of um, Benton, and they've just published a grade thickness which is identical, 140 grade um, grade meters to to Benton's. But anyway, that's let, let's get onto this news release and let's see what they actually say. So Hercules Silver drills 161 meters of 0.45 percent copper, 148 ppm moly, and 4.4 grams per ton silver. Thank you, thank you for not putting a copper equivalent in there, Mike. Goodness. Oh, just just straight up metals. Love it. Good. Um, thank you. The uh, company is pleased to report assay results drilled into the new Leviathan Porphyry Copper Discovery um, located in western Idaho, Hercules. Assay results received in batches for three step-out holes. Complete results now have been received for 2308, 2311 and partial results for 2321. Strange numbering system here. Makes me wonder what's happened to holes 9 to 10 and holes uh, 12 to 20. Maybe they weren't drilled. I don't, I, um, more information, please. That'd be, it'd be really good to know that. But they, I think the crucial thing is that here these holes were collared 220 meters east, 450 meters southeast, and 500 meters southeast. Uh, of a discovery hole, respectively. So remember what they're doing here. They're not just kind of trying to do 50 meter step outs from the one good result they got. They're doing some systematic work. 
And in fact, they go on to talk about that. They say each hole was designed to test separate parts of a near of a of a near surface 2022 IP anomaly. So by including that sentence, they're saying we are doing systematic work. We've done the geophysics, we've done the surface mapping, and now we're doing the the concept proof of concept drill program. We're not jumping around to um, kind of follow up on one good drill hole. Um, the, the the way I think kind of a good image to get in your mind is: Have you ever watched uh, under uh, you know kind of um, primary school or infant school soccer matches? You've got the football, which is kind of going around, and you've got this kind of clump of uh, soccer players all following it around. And there's no kind of shape and system to the work that they're playing. Um, or to the game that they're playing. And I think it's very similar here. What I've seen on Twitter and on social media is there's been this call for more, uh, give us more of these kinds of results rather than the kind of slightly more measured approach, which is go and test your suite of anomalies. Let's understand what the controls and mineralization are. Let's understand the geology. Let's get some vectoring going on here. Let's review this work program sensibly and then we'll advance, which is what these guys are doing so please don't jump to the conclusion that uh, this is a low grade or a small scale project just because some of these results are lower grade than the first intercept uh, and, and intercept that they um, uh, published a couple of months ago three months ago now right so um that little lecture aside let's go on with the news release the Leviathan Porphyry remains open for expansion in multiple directions and thus far has only been tested within the 22 IP server area. Great. So this is just a reminder. They're just testing. They're doing a proof of concept drilling. This first phase of blind drilling. They're, going, they're drilling blind. So you really need to know what your controls are on mineralization. You need to understand the geology before you can start jumping around. They've intersected copper within a Approximate 500 meters by 450 meter area, represented by holes 5, 8, 11, 21, and 26. Now, if you go to this map over here, you can see that hole 26 is here with no assay data, so that is yet to come, but obviously uh, in a system. Good. Hole 21 tested approximately 800 meters of vertical extent below the silver system. All holes mineralize, ended in mineralization, and uh, they put in lots of good cross sections into their news release first class work hole 21 is this one here um so the southeast to northwest so that here is the southeast there's the northwest this cross section is therefore going across this line here and you're looking from the northeast um looking from here at this cross section between hole 21 and 5 so the cross section runs through that line there and you can see that um, they've got good grades at the top here, good grades at the top here, but they've still got mineralization down in this, um, this uh, what are they calling it? This the quartz porphyry. And the last few hundred meters, what was that? A few hundred meters? Yeah, it's about um, what is that, 200 meters, maybe 300 meters of core yet to be assayed, assays yet to be returned. So um, that's interesting. Good. Right, moving on. Um, I said that all holes ended in mineralization. Now, this is interesting. A new property-wide deep penetrating IP survey um, demonstrates that the 2022 anomaly represents just a small part of a much larger four-kilometer-long potentially zoned system. So they, they, they did an initial IP survey, got some anomalies, drilling it. Oh, look, we've got mineralization. The IP seems to work. Boom, let's do a bigger one over the whole property. And now we've got four kilometers which to test. So um, uh, these are their highlights. Large step outs demonstrate significant scale to the newly discovered blind system. Yes, it also demonstrates that they're doing systematic work, which is good. Silver overprints, um, interesting. Yes, it shows that this is a polyphase, multiphase system. Low arsenic associated with the thermal silver overprinting, uh, indicating favorability for potential future smelter treatment. Now, uh, this was interesting. If you, I, I went deep. Oh, I read the whole news release, and in there they talk about doing some um, thin section work and some polished uh, reflected light microscopy. They've effectively done a, uh, a very rapid petrographic study, petrostone graphic, um, under, kind of um, graphic 
So they've looked at the mineral species through a microscope, and um, they've they've picked out that the that the metals fall in the right places. And I've seen many of these kind of early stage petrographic studies being a very good indicator for one can expect from later metallurgical test work and metallurgical studies. Um, so I, I'm impressed that they're doing that. This shows that they're doing all the right work. Um, assays remain pending. Good. Um, Hull 26 also intersected porphyry mineralization. Good. Um, we've got no cross-section of Hull 26 yet, but it'll be interesting to see what they see. Um, the deeper IP shows a much larger zone system than was previously understood, which is good. Um, mineralization remains open for expansion in multiple directions, which is good. Holes 8 and 21 ended in well-mineralized volcanic country rock, which remains open at depth. Now, it's interesting, though, because that means that this that it's not just the uh, intrusive phases which um, host the mineralization. There have been obviously some larger hydrothermal fluid flow and mineralization has uh, uh, penetrated deep into uh, the host rock, which was obviously had a degree of permeability and porosity and was a favorable um, place for precipitation of mineralization, which all it does is increases your volume of mineralized rock, which is good, even if the grade may be um, quite low. Um, so much to look out for on all of this. Um, I don't know what the market is going to do in terms of its uh, price uh, at this point. However, uh, it looks like a big system. It looks like a real deal. They've got the money from Barrack. They can drill this. They're doing a systematic approach. They've got a big uh, a four kilometer long anomaly which to test. This this looks good. This this I don't think this is um this is um this is certainly not. Um, done. There's lots of runway here, and this share price chart in the long run it might just be kind of a little foothill on the on the future growth of this company. But you've got to keep watching this thing um, and understanding the geology. Don't try and preempt it um, because then you're into the realm of speculation. But um, many many good indicators here. The team doing the right work. Sweet news release. Really succinct. Very well drafted beautiful cross-sections, no copper equivalents in sight, 10-10 in terms of the drafting. Right, uh, well, actually 9.9 .9 because there's a little typo up here. There's um, they should have, there's a space missing there, but um, so 9.9 .9 out of 10. Well done. Right. The last company for this week is uh, Cascadia Minerals, market capitalization 11 million um, Canadian, so cheap as chips, micro cap, 36 cents, uh, obviously a recent company. I'd never heard of it before. Um, did a little bit of digging around or kind of look, you look at the first news releases to see what happens when it was launched. And it was a spin out from ATAC Resources, which then got bought by Heckler Mining. Uh, the current shareholding structure of Cascadia is Heckler's own 19.9% and have got two board directors. Um, Barrick have got 7.5% and Michael Gentili has got 6.7%. So, um, you know, Michael Gentili getting behind something is, is really good. Um, you can back a story and bring proper capital into it. Share price has gone sideways this year, but actually if you look at the news flow, uh, well, it's a bit ho-hum. I, I did actually look at this a while back. Uh, this news release was a summary for 2023. Right, so Cascadia, um, Yukon, Central Yukon, the catch property in Central Yukon, 10 kilometers from an all-season highway and power line. That 10 kilometers is great, because it's not 100 kilometers, but I don't know whether it's the other side of a uh, huge huge mountain range and whether um, helicopters are required. So, drilling at the main zone through, on with the review of the year, 2023 inaugural diamond drilling resulted in a copper gold porphyry discovery mm. at the diorite zone with hull 02 hitting 116 meters of 0.31% copper and 0.3 grams gold. It's certainly a good intercept. I, would, I don't know if you can call it a discovery. Um, hull's three to five, so three, four, and five, uh, have not yet identified the source of extensive copper gold mineralization in a localized landslide. Obviously, that was a vector on drilling. So they took rubble and thought, oh, this has got to come from somewhere, let's drill it. Um, they've increased the property. They, they've yet to hit potassic alteration, uh, suggesting there's potential to discover higher grade 
uh, higher copper and gold grades in untested areas in the core of the porphyry systems. I like that. That's really um, that's you know, that's a, that's someone with a cup who's half full. Um, the cynic might say that uh, <laughs> there's also potential not to discover high copper and gold grades. But anyway, um, planning is underway for an early 2024 diamond drill program, and they talk about that diamond drill. Pro- um, they say following our successful 23 exploration season. Mm, successful um, technical success perhaps uh, we're eager to follow up with an expanded program in 2024 we've made a significant copper gold discovery at the diorite zone 116 meters or 0.3% copper and 0.3 grams gold it is actually quite hard to find stuff so you know that's good and they continue to be confident in the potential of the main zone our team is excited to start the 2024 diorite zone expansion drill program so they're going to be drilling in here and they're not going to be drilling in here. Um, and actually, when you look at the distribution of grade here, and you look at this IP anomaly, it almost looks as if there's a kind of some vertical break through this anomaly here. And actually, there's mineralization, which you could say is associated with that vertical break. So I think there's a quite a long way to go with the interpretation here. Um, but they say they are positioned to provide significant shareholder value with continued 2024 exploration success. Uh, they are. They're, well, they've got $1.8 million, so they're going to need to raise some money, but they've got a good shareholder register as a brand new company with a meaningful new discovery. We look forward to getting the Cascadia story out to a broader audience in 2024. Good luck. Good luck. Um, we need more exploration success. I think they've got quite a lot of work to do. Um, they've got to raise some money and they've got to get a handle on the mineralization. But um, they, you know, 116 meters of 0.3, 0.3 is good. Good. So keep going. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a bit of a gallop, but I hope you found it interesting. And uh, there's been, while I've been preparing this, there have been some interesting copper uh, intercepts, uh, intersections and intercepts uh, from recent drill reports. So that is going to be uh, discussed next week. But in the meantime, um, go well and uh, go copper. Thank you very much.